Welcome to this, maybe the 50th special edition of Flash Traffic on Black Man Spy. This is one of the most kinetic, frenetic years on record when it comes to activities in war and intelligence. And this week we are going to have uh, a very, very special double feature. But first, let's talk about the news of the day and why I'm doing a flash traffic. You guys may have heard that there was a attempted assassination on the life of former President Donald Trump. Donald Trump usually golfs near his Mar-a-Lago golf course on virtually any given day. And for him to move, a massive signature goes around his movements. When there are advanced police cars, motorcades. The motorcade consists of dozens of cars, followed by a press pool. It is just a giant gaggle. And so last Sunday, Donald Trump was playing golf at a golf course that it belonged to him near Mar-a-Lago. While going from the third hole, Secret Service agents were sweeping ahead of him by two holes. And somewhere around the fifth hole, a Secret Service agent who was looking at the perimeter along the wire fence saw the barrel of a rifle sticking out of part of the fence line. He saw that there was a man there who had an optic on that rifle and that to him it was a threat that was presented by what he apparently thought was a sniper. The Secret Service officer used his service revolver uh, I'm sorry, service weapon, wasn't a revolver, and engaged the would-be assassin. The man who was back there with the rifle dropped it, ran off, got into a van, and then the sheriff's department of that county rolled in and found him because a very um, astute observer, a witness who saw him running to the van, took his phone out, got a picture of the van and the license plate, and he was the uh, would-be assassin was stopped shortly. Great. This is the way that the entire process should work, right? Well, yes and no. Unlike the attempted assassination in Pennsylvania, uh, where a very squirrely individual had been seen, was carrying a backpack, got on top of a building, and got within a couple of hundred yards, 150 yards of Donald Trump, enough to shoot and kill an individual behind Trump and to uh, graze Donald Trump's ear. This individual, actually, the I'm talking perpetrator number two, actually holed up at that golf course, assuming Donald Trump would come there, because where else would Donald Trump be on a Sunday morning uh, instead of in church, where he never goes? It's a golf course, his golf course. And the gunman staked out a position which had been seen and uh, photographers had used before to take telephoto photos of Donald Trump. This individual, according to his phone records, stayed there for 12 hours before Donald Trump, the motorcade, arrived and Donald Trump started playing holes and the Secret Service officer saw him and engaged him. 12 hours, which is a lot of forethought. When they went to the position of where the gunman was, they found a modified SKS rifle. An SKS rifle uses the same magazine, that's the banana-shaped device that holds 40 rounds of ammunition, as the AK-47 semi-automatic rifle. But the SKS rifle is actually a much earlier Korean War vintage rifle uh, that it is semi-automatic when you pull the trigger, it will fire one shot and load the next. But it is considered a really vintage weapon, which has a lot of followers here in the United States. It's 7.62 by 39 uh, caliber, and it is a favorite weapon from people who do plinking, right? It's very inexpensive weapon also, but at 150 yards, the same range that he would have to have shot to get the fifth hole, he could have put down 30, if he had a 40 round magazine, 40 rounds down into the people who were at that hole in a very short period of time. So 
even though it wasn't the most advanced weapon, early reports were that it was an AR-style weapon. It was not. It was an AK, and not even an AK-style weapon. It was a very old SKS rifle, but capable of killing individuals. Another thing about the SKS that he had, it had all of its serial numbers grinded off, or tr- they, did, they did a removal of the serial numbers. But The FBI has a lot of resources to recover even grounded off serial numbers. Uh, So we should be finding out very soon where the perpetrator got the weapon. Obviously, uh, these kinds of weapons, the SKS is a very inexpensive rifle. Uh, If you go on gunbroker.com, you can buy them for two, three hundred dollars legally. But if you're a person like the perpetrator, whose name was Ryan Routh, He was a former convicted felon who had no authorization to own firearms. So, of course, he would have purchased this on the firearm black market. Uh, And that would have cost him not hundreds of dollars, probably a thousand or more dollars to buy a very cheap used uh, gun, which was probably stolen from somewhere, had the serial numbers ground off and then went around the you know, uh, the criminal underground where people do sell weapons all the time. Let's talk about the perpetrator. Ryan Routh is an interesting character, not only because he has been arrested and has been arraigned and is now being held on a series of charges and is being investigated by the uh, district attorney of uh, Palm Beach and the FBI on federal gun charges and a whole raft of other charges I'm sure that they'll think up. It's because in an oblique way, I sort of know who he is. It turns out Ryan Routh, and the first time I've ever heard his name, was mentioned in the same crazy New York Times article that came out in March 2023, uh, in which uh, Thomas Gibbons Neff, the journalist, and Justin, I can't even remember that guy's name, the other journalist, wrote an article about people in Ukraine who had stolen valor and other things even though the article said that I was awesome and my contribution to the chaos in Ukraine is that I called a former associate on Twitter a fat ass, which is true because he does have quite a corpulent butt. Um, Somehow I got into that article, which is I don't understand because it essentially said that my support of the International Legion was well known. But later on in that article, they talked about this guy, Ryan Routh, who was an American that had come to Ukraine and had hung out around Maidan Square and St. Michael's Square and was recruiting for the foreign fighters for the International Legion. Now, prior to this, I had heard that there were various people doing this, but I didn't know his name, right? Uh, His grand plan, which was in the New York Times article, was that he was trying to recruit Afghans to come through Pakistan and then bring them illegally to Ukraine through Moldova and then get them to join his version of the International Legion. I spent almost a year in the Legion. I communicate with Ukraine and the Legion battalions every day over the last two and a half years, and I never heard about this crazy plan. But when it was brought to my attention that Ryan Routh is the guy who used to hang around Maidan Square. Many people had communicated with him on what he had, a signal chat called the International Volunteers Chat. Um, Then it popped into my head because many of my guys had mentioned an American who was hanging out down there who wore an American flag bandana. And he was known as Bandana Guy. Well, Bandana Guy at the time that he came to Ukraine was like 56 years old. He had no experience. He, according to his own words on his own website in a crazy book that he had written, self wrote, um, he was 56 years old, no experience, and tried to join the International Legion somewhere. I don't know where. I never heard of him. No one contacted me to vet this guy. Uh, And he was rejected because he was too old. Well, I was older than him, and I was accepted because I went the only authorized route you can go through, which is to go to an embassy in your home nation, have them communicate with them, have them vet you. Then they are waiting for you at the border. You go to the border. There's a special processing facility. 
for legionnaires where they vet you to see if you're a Russian spy. And then they send you on to the training battalion and off you go after a month or two to the battlefront as part of the International Legion. This guy apparently never did that and then got it into his head that he could just recruit people all on his own by hanging out in Kiev and going to bars and just telling people he was recruiting. In fact, I don't know anyone, and I know hundreds of people, and I've put the word out. I don't know anyone that was recruited into the International Legion by this guy. I think he was recruiting right up here in his own head, and what he was doing was approaching impressionable young men on the streets of Kiev. Have no earthly idea. Fast forward to that, and I've never met him, by the way. You know, there's all sorts of things. Fast forward to that, somehow somebody in the right-wing media has put one and one together and got 725, and it somehow claimed that I was somehow involved with Ryan Rolf. Well, if there's anything we know about right-wing extremists, is that they capitalize on a lie to further their propaganda. And what better propaganda to say, oh, an ex-MSNBC host who's in the International Legion is associated with a would-be assassin. Sorry, folks, not associated. You're just going to have to get your lies elsewhere. On the other hand, Ryan Ralph was not a Democrat. Like the assassin, attempted assassin who was killed in Butler, Pennsylvania, he was a conservative. And there appears to be a problem in the Republican Party with conservatives who are disappointed with Trump and are taking shots at him. This guy, Ryan Ralph, voted for Trump in 2016, apparently became disillusioned with him, and in January of this year made Twitter posts supporting Nikki Haley and the even crazier, Trumpier Vivek Ramaswamy, hoping that they could save America and help Ukraine. He was apparently very pro-Ukraine. So that being said, This guy, Ryan Rofe, who has nothing to do with me or my beloved brothers and sisters of the International Legion, was one of the major crazies and crusaders uh, and criminals, because he was a former criminal, who popped up in Ukraine and went there to reinvent themselves. And there will be an op-ed soon on my Substack and in a major newspaper talking about the kinds of people who came to Ukraine who should never have been allowed in who reinvented themselves as war correspondents or humanitarian NGOs or the Ukrainian version of Florence Nightingale, or as I call it, the Facebook Florence Nightingales. Many people who did come there are serving and helping out, but not everyone does. And this war, unlike the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, which had billions of dollars floating around in the sky and you could just snatch them out of the air, The people who went to Ukraine, there is no money in Ukraine. You cannot make money in Ukraine. The only way you can make money is through donations. And that's apparently how this guy was surviving there, uh, you know, by whatever he was doing. Okay, he had it in his head. He was recruiting. He wasn't. The Ukrainian army never interacted with him. And his crazy idea is to bring in hundreds of Afghans, you know, who could be Taliban or whatever, never came to fruition. So again, the only time I ever heard of this guy was the first time was the New York Times article. And then the second time was when he was arrested (laughs) So for attempted assassination of Donald Trump. So the world, look, I don't even feel like I'm six degrees of separation, uh, you know, from uh, from Kevin Spacey or whoever else in this world. I'm about 40 steps of separation from this Yahoo. But like I said, In this crazy, extremist, hyper-violent, hyper-propagandized world, some idiots out there are trying to say, you were in Ukraine and he was in Ukraine, therefore you're all co-conspirators. Weird world, but that's just the way it is. A lesson in abject propaganda. So that being said, there's going to be a lot more to come out about this individual who apparently lived in Hawaii lived in North Carolina, where he was arrested for having a fully automatic weapon, leading police on a police chase, and having a hostage barrel or a barricaded situation 
against the police, and that's what got him arrested before. How he traveled overseas on his passports beyond me. But he did. And then when he got back to the United States after five months in Ukraine, I think it was five months, uh, he moved to Hawaii and, uh, you know, did a whole bunch of other things. But at some point, and nobody knows how, he got a weapon and went down to Florida. And we're going to find out a lot more about this crazy story. So that's the end of this particular flash traffic. Be sure to subscribe to malcolmnance.substack.com where I will have way more writing to uh, to be said about this. That's the only way that you're going to get it. And follow me on YouTube and subscribe on YouTube. We're going to be putting out a whole boatload more uh, black man spies. And uh, we're going to go back to the regular black man spy uh, for our October 7th special. And uh, Instagram and Facebook. So thanks for watching this edition of Black Man Spy Flash Traffic. See you out there.